is, I'll put this on one end, so. Okay, that's somewhat big enough. And also, uh, well. Cool. If you guys have written Rust before, then basically like you gotta make a new project. Um, basically. Uh, then you name it whatever folder you want. So I can be like, I can call it like chat example. Something like that. Now I'll just create a folder with, with your Rust project. Let me know if you guys want it zoomed in too. I mean, I can see it okay from here, but just in case, I can make this side smaller, make this, that side bigger. <laughs> But uh, basically, once you guys have done that, so inside your cargo.toml, uh, is it what? The password, sorry? Yeah, just the password. Oh, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. That good? Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Oh, also like, how many of you guys are like new, completely new to Rust, by the way? Just curious. Yep. Gotcha. Yeah, no good. Level the pace. And also, I guess I'll probably just do this now. Um, whoever uses uh, Linux, you might cringe at me using uh, Nano right now, but that's okay. <laughs> basically, it's like a, there's this extra cargo.toml stuff. Uh, you basically just like slap it on there uh, inside your cargo.toml file. And I didn't actually put this yet, but there's like a, let me save this first. Note that these commands don't work unless you install a special extension. But it'll basically update your cargo.tml and then I can show you guys like what the cargo.tml looks like. So this is kind of like how you should set up your cargo.tml. It should look like that. The profile release, the lib and a the dependent six thingy. The, the versions are 0 0.2.2. Oh, uh, to create the new project. So there was like uh, this cargo new. And this is like the name of the folder that it'll, it'll make. And then I like got into the folder. And then I modified this cargo TML. The cargo TML looks like that. Oh yeah, the, the add command won't work unless you get an extension, but you can basically, basically your cargo TML just needs to look like that. You don't need to call the add commands. Basically what that does is it just like imports in. Um, there's like the Rust package library if you're from a JavaScript background, it's like NPM. And we reserve the Rust library, the Rust crate name, smart contract and smart contract macros because nobody else took them. <laughs> it's basically what lets you start using the smart contract functionality inside Rust. Or sorry, SDK basically. So can you just comment that uh, Cargo new lib and then some names like chat or chat example or something like that. Have 
Need any help? Okay. Okay. Yeah. If you also want to know, like, I guess if you're like a seasoned Rust expert, you might not know what those flags are. LTO is this thing called link time optimization. The thing is that WebAssembly modules are typically quite big. They're like, Solidity, Solidity smart contracts are like really small, uh, like a couple of hundred bytes. WebAssembly modules, realistically, they're actually like within the KB range, kilobytes. Uh, so basically, like we can tell the Rust compiler, like let's like be more, uh, be more forceful on the optimization, be more aggressive on the optimization. So the so the web is, your what your smart contract size is smaller. So that's what LTL link time optimization means. And uh, that lib flag, it's basically just uh, something that's mandatory to compile down to a .wasm file, a WebAssembly module. That's the file format, .wasm. How's it on your site? Cool. Uh, anyone else still in progress? All good? Oh, it's installing right now? Cool. Sweet. I mean, uh, just in case, like, uh, you, you two can, like, share the uh, carter.tml just in case, right? All right, because in that case, like, uh, we can actually dig into some code. <laughs> um, basically, so I called this chat example. I'm gonna, I got this fancy IntelliJ ID. IntelliJ supports um, WebAssembly smart contracts. Basically, like, uh, you got that whole source folder and everything. Uh, you just delete everything inside it. Um, and we can basically start. So we're making a decentralized chat. Uh, basically, we need like one data structure. We need to have a place to store the, la the most recent 50 messages. Um, so basically, this is kind of how it works. You make a struct, like let's call it chat, name it whatever you want. And I'm gonna have like a bunch of like logs. Um, and Rust has a standard library, so it's got a bunch of like data structures already pre-done, like a queue, a list, like I'm gonna use a queue. And the queue is called a vec. vec. <laughs> uh, is, is this visible, or would you guys like? Yeah, no problem. Actually, I was curious, like, how do you do the font size thing? So, say it's like 20, 24. Yeah, that's true. Just like delete it all. And then uh, I'm gonna have a vec, so like a queue of a bunch of chat messages, so they're just strings. And that's pretty much the only data structure I need. It's so like a, this queue, it's a double ended queue, so you can like put data in the front of the queue or in the back of the queue. You can pop data from the front, back, basically just that. And the way you implement your smart contract now, like I got that data structure, I need to implement some smart contract methods. Um, there's this, if you're familiar with Rust, there's basically like this, uh, you can import in macros, and macros do some like magic helping to uh, basically convert your code into, uh, to basically like pull in data, the necessary data to basically get consensus related info and block info uh, for your smart contract. And the way you use it is you put a tag like that. And this implement block, this is where you define all your smart contract functions. This is something that's kind of mandatory. Um, every single like uh, 
smart contract should have an initialization. I got to initialize the data structure and make it like the lo an empty logs queue, double in a queue. So it's like fn init. Uh, there's this like parameters. Return itself. It's like, ah, uh, there's an error because I got to initialize the queue. If you're curious what this params thing is, it's basically the SDK automatically gets like all of the information uh, from Wavelet, the blockchain, and it always it's always like the first parameter in every single function in your smart contract. So I'm not able to view it here, but I can probably just pop it up. Uh, payload parameters. Basically, you have the transaction ID, the who called the function. You can also send money while you're calling a function, but basically, like, this is just what this struct does. And the internals of it looks like this. Um, because actually, when you like pull bytes out, out of it, it actually like mutates the, the data inside the parameters object, uh, struct. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And the reason for that is just to like uh, reduce the amount of byte copying and stuff, so it's just more efficient. Uh, oh, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> does it, uh, are you using IntelliJ right now? Oh, um, do you have the Rust plugin? Oh. Yeah. You, uh, so for if you're using IntelliJ specifically, that you need like to to like have this uh, plugins, and then you just search like Rust. And install that. Um, so there's going to be like two functions that I'll need in my smart contract. Um, I want to put a message into the chat room or chat whatever, and I need a way to get all the messages. So let's just do the send message function first. Uh, this lets me get uh, get access to this chat struct, and also I'm I'm going to have the par parameters this time. And uh, basically, like each function can is a returns a result, which means that the string. If you return a string, it'll be an error. Otherwise, it'll be okay. You can say like the smart contract executed all right. So by default, we'll say like it, it's always executes just fine. Um, now, how do I like get? If I call a send message function, I'll put in a chat message uh, to get like the inputted message. This is basically like the syntax on how it's done. It shows it as an error on my ID. Actually, it's a bug <laughs> with how uh, the syntax highlighting, uh, sorry, the syntax parsing is done. But basically, like this is actually fine. It basically just gets a, it reads a string from the parameters, and the order in which you like read from parameters matters. So you can like read an, a whole bunch of stuff, like some number. Uh, an unsigned 64-bit little any integer, <laughs> and you just call parents every, or you can do like some boolean. Basically, that's like the syntax, and it automatically like reads any kind of data structure, uh, any kind of like data type, primitive data type. In this case, like uh, we don't need that for sending a message. We just need, we just want to know somebody put a message into our smart contract. I, I just want a string. And I'll know like how does it, so it's just, parameters is just a bunch of bytes. It'll like learn, how, know how to read two strings, uh, even if they're the same data type and stuff. Yeah, it's got some funky formatting. I'll even like just call this message. Um, now, as we said, we wanna like limit how large these messages are. So th the way that's done is um, it needs to be if it's zero or the message length is like greater than 240, that's like the max, then we can return an error saying message must not be empty and must be then equal to 240 characters. String. Dude. 
So that's like our first constraint check. Oh, so um, there's a primitive string and then there's a heap allocated string. So, so actually like where there's stack allocated or heap allocated, Rust actually like tells you, like makes you like emphasize that. <laughs> So uh, it returns a heap allocated string, but then you gotta like turn the primitive into a heap allocated one. Yeah, that's pretty much that. Uh, the next part is I'm gonna put the message in the log. Uh, I'm gonna put it in the in the front of the queue, so that like, because um, I want like the index zero of the logs to be the latest message. So if that's a little confusing, this is like I want to push it to the front of the queue and. So, the message. Um, there's one more thing is that like I want to be sure logs is always at most of length 50. I notice there's 50 messages inside the log. So if like the logs, the length is greater than 50, I'm gonna like pop from the back. So first in, first out, that sort of thing. <laughs> It's a, uh, so there's like some stuff in the standard library of Rust. Um, OK is like a enum type of result. And there's like OK or error. And uh, by default, it's like implicitly imported in. I always find that weird, actually. Like, why don't you make sure, right, say that it's imported or something? I, I don't know why. But yeah, that's your whole send message function with like all the fancy if statements and stuff. <laughs> and then the, uh, there's a get messages function, of course. Uh, we don't need params in this. We just want to like print out everything that's in the logs. And uh, it's pretty straightforward. So for message in at self dot. Logs. Uh, I'm gonna. Oh, I need to find a way to print out the message, right? Um, so this is where we're using one of those WebAssembly imported functions. Uh, Wavelet uh, imports uh, imports in a function that lets you uh, put some logs out of the contract. So it's kind of like smart contract events in Solidity, something like that. And uh, Basically, it's this. I'll just import this in quick. Smart contract uh, log. It's this log function that you got to import in. And you just put a message. Uh, log is like a print ln, basically. So it prints a new line. So if I print, if I call log on each message, it'll make like a line, lines of uh, the most recent top 50 messages, whatever is stored inside logs. Um, and if you guys got that far, then you're done your contract. Actually, that's 38 lines of code. Eh? Probably the most trickiest thing, which is a bit weird to some people, is how parameters get read. Like, but the reason why is it's kind of just how the WebAssembly spec is. WebAssembly only knows four data types, integers and floats. Um, uh, integers are used to represent pointers to memory. And so basically, like, basically it's, uh, if we made it so that you can like put a message string right over here, it's actually doing a lot of magic. And we feel like developers shouldn't be, shouldn't, should know kind of what, what your code is actually doing. So we basically just made it so that the parameters need to be implicitly read out through this, this es kind of esoteric format. Yeah, uh, how many of you guys have like written down the whole contract? Can you go back to the top? Sure. The magic Two? I'll see you. Sweet. Yeah. 
And for those of you guys that are done, um, this is just in the um, inside the chat example folder. You're basic, basically like you can just run this command. It's a bit, it's a bit long, but basically it builds the WebAssembly module with a release flag, so it does like some optimizations on this on the size of the contract, and it targets uh, wasn't free to unknown oh, unknown. It's basically composite down to WebAssembly. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. I can show you that. And if you got this command down, you just that's a little bit. I should be right as a uh, rest of my contract and like they have like a lot more dependencies. So it's actually quite fast. Like we only have 11 dependencies here. Uh, and yeah, it got fully built. <laughs> so like where, where can you locate your .wasm, your WebAssembly module file? Um, it explicitly is in this target wasm for you to unknown release folder, or maybe I'll show it here. So if you guys like ran this command, which is a little line breaked, compile it, it should be successful. And then you go inside a release folder and then you got this wonderful chat example that allows them, which is 364 bytes-ish. Yeah, uh, but there, because we enabled a uh, link time optimization, actually like it's, it becomes really small. So like the interesting thing is like, what if I did not include in LTO. It's also roughly the same uh, time it takes to compile. It reduces the binary size by a ton. It's case. So just doing, putting that back in. Uh, yep. And then we got our lovely chat example. Awesome. If you guys have done all of that, then basically, like, well. Programming is done. You guys can already can already just start testing it, and like I'll show you guys how to deploy it basically. Um, so we got a public test net running where basically you guys can just like deploy contracts, whatever you want, really. Uh, and you can there's also like a test net faucet so you can get the cryptocurrency needed. Ours is called Pearls. Uh, in order to like deploy the contract, um, and it's uh, lens.perlin.net. Just gonna put that here. Cool. And also, just like, uh, just curious, how many of you guys have really like built your, uh, the WebAssembly module? Sweet. Yeah. All right. But okay. Basically, the next steps then is just. Uh, you can get into the testnet by going to lens.perlin.net. And afterwards, like it'll, if you've never used it before, it'll basically just generate a random account for you. you know, keep generating new ones. You can even download the key if you want. Um, and this is like the, the HTTP API address. Just log in. And bam, connected in. Kind of hard to see, but uh, there's zero pearls right now. So I need like some cryptocurrency in order to deploy my smart contract. So there's this faucet button right here that we've made. Click it. Click at pearls, and uh, yeah, I, the blockchain finalized, and I have one pearl. One pearl is more than enough to deploy a smart contract. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's actually like under, underneath the hood. Uh, it's like uh, ten to the power of nine 
subunits equals to one pearl. So the gas class is like composed of subunits. <laughs> So basically, to deploy it, go to the developer tab. You need a gas limit. And you can put like, all right, just put willy-nilly, it's like 75%, 0.75 pearls. Um, and then basically, like, you can, wherever your smart contract is, you just upload a, that a WASM. And it's basically deploying it right now. And successful. You got your smart contract ID and everything. Um, and recall when I was talking about the WebAssembly structure? Actually, like because the browser has a WebAssembly VM, it actually automatically decompiles a WebAssembly file in your browser just so you can see. Like These are the import functions. Remember when I was talking about payload, result, log? It's right here. And what is the exported functions? Um, if you go at the bottom, it exports a uh, underscore contract underscore in it, send message and get messages. So this is like literally internally how the WebAssembly smart contract looks like. These are the exports and then you got the imports uh, imported from the Wavelet blockchain. And it even like, uh, yep. Yes. So can you write like a function that does like one for each log or whatever? Yes. You can also like uh, just write functions willy nilly, just not inside the implement block, and then you can just uh, do it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, to test it out, basically like we can just send a bunch of messages. So uh, you gotta like we know that uh, the send message uh, accepts a string. Uh, so I can do like hello world. Put in a gas limit call the function, let it do its thing. And that worked, I can put some more. Ah, gotta get the gas limit. And you can see like these pearls are being deducted in real time. Could be 50%, 25%. Just make sure that you got, your, you got some pearls from the faucet. That's in case it's failing. Looks like it's stuck. That's weird. So what I can just do is I can just take my contract ID. Uh, push the page just in case. And I can like enter the address of it again. And it'll, uh, basically I just get the exact same thing. Uh, and I can like try put in like, this is test one, two, three. Yeah, probably because internet stuff, yeah. Oh. So I've already like invoked it twice. Now I can do the get messages. So the thing is that there's a simulate call button. Basically what it does, which is pretty cool, uh, the browser has a WebAssembly VM. What it'll do is it'll get the latest memory of your smart contract from, from, a, from one of the Wavelet nodes. It'll import it into the browser and you can actually like query against your smart contract inside your browser. So. I don't need to put any gas or anything. Um, I just do get messages uh, with no parameters. Simulate call. And, oh, yeah, so the, third, uh, the call that was stuck actually worked. And that's the result. It pretty much logged everything and it just printed it out straight from the smart contract. Uh, this is a test one tree, it's the most recent one. Uh, the very first message I put in, which is the oldest, is hello world. Um, invalid gas limit. Uh, do you have any pearls in your account? Or uh, When you click 75%, like what number does it put? 225. When you press 75%? Oh, that's, it should be something like 0. 4, 0 0.5 or something like that. Yeah. So 
you just need to put something like 0 0.5 or 0 0.6 and it should be fine. Um, but I mean, so literally like if that's all understood, that's basically how you make a smart contract. <laughs> it's literally as simple as that. And uh, actually you can get pretty funky with it. So I didn't go over the front end portion, but if you know JavaScript, there's this like really nice JavaScript library. We have a client JS. And uh, we, we personally at Perlin, we don't really like WebFreeJS, the one that's used for Ethereum. We literally made it so that uh, interacting with a wavelet node, it's just one file. And uh, it's, it's like fully documented and it's just about like 995 lines of code. So think of WebFreeJS, but it's literally just a thousand lines of code with documentation and stuff. And so it's easily readable so that you guys can actually like tell how exactly you interact with the wavelet node via the HTTP API. Um, and that's, that's how this Fox Explorer thingy got built as well. Mm, and in terms of like what capabilities, like we just built a really simple chat example, but the reality is like, a, what was it there for? <laughs> we actually like built some like pretty funky stuff, um, like games and whatnot, I think. This was something that we did for fun quite some time ago, where we actually like built a full scale real time game, where like you basically click click this clam and it'll like get you artificial in game pearls, and this is all powered by this, by a by a smart contract. It's got upgrades and all that stuff, and basically like it produces like over two thousand transactions per second. The Wavelet blockchain is capable of handling that, so that's perfectly fine. It's just kind of like. What exactly can you build? You can build anything. You could even like use existing Rust libraries uh, from the community and uh, do whatever you want. If you're into cryptographies or knowledge proofs, you can do that. That's not a problem. You just gotta have enough pearls and from testnet it's unlimited. But uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> um, only thing then I would say is that we're also doing a small little raffle. So basically, the link is bit.ly Perlin SFBW. But basically, like we're giving away 5,000 real pearls. We're listed over on Binance, so we're like real token as well. Point is like, we just basically wanna give a, give a sort of like a shout out or just give away 5,000 pearls. A lot of our products are doing it, so we figured why not. Thank you. <laughs> I'll, uh, Just that. If you guys got to the end of it, uh, submit your smart contract ready, and then most probably you'll get a chance to get the thousand pearls. <laughs> so yeah, hopefully all is good. If you guys also just want some additional help, like let's say you guys actually want to build something crazy out of it, uh, we also have like a Discord channel available and everything. Um, overall, though, you can just go on to Perlin.net site. Got a whole bunch of stuff. And at the very end of it, uh, there's a technical Discord chat. Uh, we and the core dev team, we're on it regularly. If you have any questions regarding anything, regarding WebAssembly, regarding making a smart contract, regarding what's the capabilities, just reach out to us, or if you just want a general community, like how's Perlin doing without the tech stuff, there's a Telegram. You can also ask the technical questions, we'll probably pop in every now and then. But yeah, thank you. <laughs>